Hello, I'm Josh Close, and I would like to demonstrate how I made my project for the Fluid Dimension Challenge that RealFlow and Cinema 4D hosted, where the challenge was to take a photo, project it onto 3D geometry inside of Cinema 4D, and introduce some fluid dynamics using RealFlow. I had a rough idea of what I wanted to do for the project, having fluid crawl across a person's face, but I didn't know what the shots or the lighting would look like, so I just went into the studio to try some options. And this is what the lighting setup I used looked like. Uh, the actress was just seated in front of the camera with a key light behind her pointed at a white card, and I had a reflector pointed back towards her face to keep the light along the edge of her face and get a nice rim light. I had a black card behind the camera that was helping to keep the front side of the face pretty dark and keep a nice contrast and I had black pieces of cloth on the floor because I was shooting in a green screen stage and I didn't want any of that green spilling back on. Uh, I shot it on the red epic and I would roll for a few seconds, maybe five seconds, and then just choose the frame that I liked the most out of that few seconds. I shot these images in 5k to give myself enough resolution to work with and I didn't get the lighting the first try. I'll show you some of my red clips. This was one of the first ones I took. This is just terrible. And after a while, I just kind of tweaked the lighting. I think this might have been the take that I ended up using, but as you can see, I just have a few seconds and then there's blinks in there and everything. So having this many frames to work with is nice. And here's a few more of the setups I tried backing out. Having large resolutions, um, some still cameras can shoot at really high resolutions that can be helpful because you can back out a little bit and crop in a little bit later. Here's some more clips I tried from a few different angles. I was moving reflectors around a lot as I was doing this. I would just end up moving the reflector a few feet and then come back to the camera and see what it looked like. Um, and some of the later profile shots that we did didn't look so great out of the camera, but that's nothing that Photoshop can't fix. Um, a person's silhouette as their chin is tilted upward doesn't look exactly how I pictured it in my head. Uh, with a little bit of reshaping in Photoshop, you can really kind of fine tune a person's silhouette and keep the line on the head, for example, to be nice and smooth and not have any excess hair or anything. And it's certainly made easy by having a solid background like this um, a white background makes it much easier to reshape and sort of warp around your image. Since the actress was going to be 3D modeled and then the image reprojected back onto that 3D model, it was important to take a lot of stills while I was shooting to make sure that I had a good reference point to do the model of the face. So I would stop after each take and turn on all the lights and then just run around with the camera basically taking hundreds of pictures for each shot just to make sure I had what the face looked like from every angle and this probably isn't super necessary unless you have a larger camera move but it's sort of a force of habit because with projecting images back over geometry the more accurate the geometry is the better it's going to turn out and the farther you can go with the camera move and that will make a little bit more sense later but it's just something to stay aware of keep a camera near you the whole time. The first step is to prepare the image in Photoshop. So I took the red clip and converted the red clip to an EXR sequence and then I chose the frame that I wanted and brought that EXR into Photoshop. And then inside of Photoshop, I just did a few uh, blemish removals and cleaning up of the eyelashes. Uh, everyone has imperfections in their face, so you can just get rid of a couple of those in Photoshop since we're going to be so close to the face in some of these shots. So like I said, I just did a uh, one pass of blemish removal and then I even removed the eyelashes and painted in some new ones just to make the image a little bit cleaner, a little bit nicer. And then in the final shot, there was a little bit more done to this one. Um, I mentioned earlier that the hair in the back here is kind of strange. Uh, when somebody tilts their head up, that's just something that happens naturally. The hair dips down, but I didn't quite like that. So all that can be kind of pushed and warped around inside of Photoshop and the excess hairs that were kind of sitting outside of the silhouette on the bottom and on the top. Some of those were cleaned up and then the neck was sort of pulled in just to make a nice more smooth shape. So 3D modeling the face. This is where the reference images come in. The more the better. You can use all of these images to help you in the modeling process. This is what my model looked like in the end. 
if I display so we can actually see it. I added more detail than is probably necessary to this, but the main things that you want in this case is the nose and a little bit of the ear because as the camera moves sort of like this, you'll see that there are pieces of the face, there are pixels that are revealed as you know the nose occludes them or you start to see around that edge. So that's an important, an important piece of the model. But all this stuff in the middle probably could have just been smooth and it would have been okay. Um, if I look at this from the camera view, another thing you can do to help you model is to use a background and then apply a texture to your background. And you can sort of get the model exactly in the position that it needs to be and get the silhouette just right. And this takes, you know, a little bit of work to get it to fit the model appropriately. But again, this can be much more rough than I ended up making it. The next step, once you have your model set up, is to project the photo back onto the model. So when you hit render, it shows you the actual texture. And the way to do that, or the way that I chose to do that in Cinema 4D, if you go to the Window tab, then you can hit Projection Man. And then you drag your model onto the camera you want to project from, hit Load Bitmap, load in your bitmap, and then hit OK here. And it will create a shader down here. And I'm going to turn off the reflectance and the alpha channels because we don't need those. We just want to project the color information. And then the camera that you project from shouldn't move because then it will move the projection and it will get distorted. That camera should stay from the angle that it was modeled from. But now when you hit render, you can actually see the texture is rendering through here. And you'll be able to quickly see where the limitations of 3D projection are. You don't want to go up too high because then you'll start to see around the nose and you'll see the texture sort of repeat itself. Um, you can kind of just do, in this case, downward motions like this. That was the camera move I did. It was just a really simple kind of drifting camera. And that allows you to, you know, kind of move around the model. And that sort of turns your once 2D image into a 3D image. And the farther you go, the more you'll start to reveal the problems with the model, unless you have a really accurate model. Um, but this is how you actually apply the 3D projection to a model in Cinema. Now I'd like to do a quick walkthrough on the fluid simulation portion of the final shot in the project inside of RealFlow. This is what my scene looked like inside of RealFlow. These were the demons that I chose to use, and these are my two different emitters. And I'll start by showing the preview of the final simulation so you can sort of see how it actually worked. I had two object emitters here. The one on the outside was to create sort of the fill of fluid that kind of flows around. And then the interior emitter was for the fluid that would sort of crawl up the model with a strong force in the magic demon. And I have the caption script that a coworker of mine and I set up over here on the right. So you can actually see the demons that were used in the scene and you can see the settings that I had for each of them. So in the end, I think I had uh, a little over a million particles in the exterior emitter. Uh, actually, it looks like two and a half million particles up here, and almost two million in the interior emitter. So I like to use high particle counts. It's good to get a lot of that fine detail into the model, but um, it takes a lot of simulation time. Um, I simulated these in just under seven hours, it looks like, down here on the bottom right. So that's something to keep in mind. When you're testing your settings, you'll want to do it at um, as low resolution as possible while still being able to work in the scene and uh, see what your forces are actually doing. With that in mind, I'm going to demonstrate how these forces worked with very low fluid resolutions so we don't have to wait so long for feedback. So the first thing I'm going to do is turn off the two demon forces on my second object emitter, which is for this object in the exterior. And uh, I'll keep the kill volume and the kill isolated on so any particle that leaves the kill volume will not be part of the calculation anymore. And kill isolated will remove a particle that wanders off by itself after it's been alone for a certain amount of time. And I didn't want any stray particles or uh, gravity or anything like that because this isn't a realistic simulation. This is just kind of a fantasy, morphous looking fluid that moves around. So without any forces, I'll go ahead and start this simulation so we can see how the fluid leaves the object down here towards the normal direction of the object, which is the front facing of the polygons on the object. 
and it just goes in a straight line. And at lower resolutions, the fluid kind of acts separately on each face because they don't get a chance to really connect. You can see that these two up here do, but a lot of the other ones are kept separate. And when you simulate at higher resolutions, that doesn't happen as much. They kind of can spill together a little more frequently. So to get some more interesting movement, the first thing that I added was a noise field. And my noise field didn't have any animation on it and it had a sort of large space scale and what that means is you can see this little tendril of fluid here kind of curves as it emits and that's because my non-animated noise field just kind of sits in the scene so the fluid swims through it almost um, but it maintains the shape so as it gets pushed through this noise field the shape along the fluid is kept since it's not being animated and something that RealFlow has, a new feature in 2014, that I think is really helpful is the ability to see what those fields look like. So I'll quickly show that. If you go to Show Field in the options, you can actually see the vector forces in the noise field. And I chose a space scale of 0.3, but you can see this a little bit easier. If I turn down the spacing to 0.75, so we can see a lot more of the arrows, uh, the vectors, and if I change the space scale to like 0.1, then you can see a lot more clearly what 3D noise looks like and how the fluid will move through it. And this is a really, really helpful tool, the ability to display these force fields. So you can actually see what your fluids are going to do without having to kind of guess around in the dark or do trial and error. It takes a lot of the trial and error out of it. So now with the vortex, uh, I'll attach the vortex demon here so we can see that. And the vortex just creates a force that goes in a circle around, in this case, the model, but it's whatever direction you face the vortex. You can also turn on the display fields on the um, vortex as well. And if you looked at it from the top, you would see that the vectors travel in a circle around the model. But when I have my vector force, the fluid just kind of travels in a circle around the model. And for the exterior emitter, that was all I really had, was some fluid that traveled in a circle through a noise field around the model. And then for the interior object emitter, I had a vortex that also made it move around a magic demon, which just pulls the fluid tightly to the model or whatever object you set. And then I had a sheeter, which caused the um, fluid to fill in. Oh, my resolution is a little bit too low there. Change that to something so we can see it. Oh wait, I think I actually animated this. Yeah, so you can see that the fluid is pulled towards the model and it kind of crawls up. I had both of these emitters running at the same time and they were interacting with one another so it just kind of splashed together in this spirally vortex around the model that I had brought in. The last step before bringing it back into Cinema 4D for rendering is to create the mesh. And I did the meshes inside of RealFlow as well. And if you select on the emitter inside of the mesh, you can find the radius setting, which is the most important setting. Um, if you want a detailed description of what it does, you can hit F1 on these and it will show you a description on what it actually does but the basic concept here is that each little particle will create like a ball of geometry and when they overlap they sort of build together as one mesh so the more particles you have it can be a lot you know a lot more painless to mesh them together because there's a lot more potential for smaller radiuses and groupings of particles will mesh a little bit better than like a group that's off by itself. Um, the other settings that were really important for this mesh were to make sure that the polygon size was small enough that I could render it for my shot because my shot had a relatively large size of the fluid in the shot so I wanted to make sure that it was smooth enough that you didn't see too much faceting and I also applied possibly heavier than normal 
filtering on the mesh, which sort of works like a relax. Um, it kind of pulls the mesh tighter around the particles. And there's kind of a trade-off because as you pull it a little bit tighter, you can sometimes lose a little bit of particles almost. The thin areas can sometimes disappear a little bit if you over relax or over thin or raise the tension or anything like that. So you just want to be careful not to go too far with the settings. Again, it's a lot of trial and error with this. And if I turn on my uh, selection highlighting, I'll show you, I had my polygon size really small. So it's kind of hard to see. And I can't really navigate the viewport right now because there's seven and a half million polygons just on this one mesh. But I had my polygons very, very small. And that just makes it so the mesh has a lot of detail. And that's also at the expense of file size. I think my meshes were like 250 megabytes per frame. So keep that in mind. When you're doing simulations, you'll want to have a good amount of hard drive space to work from and a fast hard drive because it'll need to be reading back and forth all the time. So now we can go into Cinema and import the mesh in. This is what my scene looked like in Cinema. I had projected this in the same way that I did the first shot. I just had a camera sort of from this angle over here. And when you install RealFlow, you can install the connectivity plugins for whichever 3D package you use. And in Cinema, it gives you a RealFlow menu in the plugins menu where you can import the RealFlow mesh. And the meshes can get kind of heavy in the viewport, so I usually keep them turned off. Um, this one had like 7 million polys in it, so it gets sort of slow to keep it active. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, to create the shader, I just created something super basic. So I just had sort of a black reflection. And in the reflectance, I just use a two layer reflectance where the second layer was the sharper reflection and the first layer was the blurry or diffuse reflection. And those two layered on top of each other gives a pretty cool look. And then I set up sort of a studio lighting scene um, I used Grayscale Gorilla's HDRI light kit, and I would like this the same way even if I wasn't using his light kit, but the light kit kind of made it easier and quicker to just kind of throw in some nice textured soft boxes. And this was like, you know, your basic light on top, one behind, and then a reflector in the front to just kind of get a lot of the... Um, light on the side over here and get the profile sort of defined and that was pretty much it for the lighting and shading the last step is to render it i rendered this using multi-channel exrs so if i go into my render settings here's what my settings were i rendered it in hd and then i chose to do the multi-pass where i had just my regular rgba then i would include ambient occlusion the object buffers allowed me to create mats for my two separate fluids for matting inside of the compositing software or doing any kind of separate color corrections or whatever I needed to do afterward. And I included the depth channel so I could apply depth of field. I used the motion vector to apply motion blur, although the motion blur was almost invisible in this rendering. And uh, that was pretty much it. And then I brought those inside of After Effects. I used the extractor plugin to pull out each channel separately and then composite them over one another.